have a very special link here uh, to how to fundraise your company. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, you already have some ideas and have some questions about. Um, you probably think, should I talk with investors? Uh, do they really like it? Um, or um, how do I reach it? Or where, where do I need to reach it? We reach that. So uh, today we have an opportunity to see uh, uh, some real angels around. Um, uh, this is our schedule for today's workshop. Uh, we'll have um, our special guest Eugene No to introduce some uh, two interesting programs in, in, on campus. Uh, then we have uh, another special guest to introduce her company. Uh, then we have four speakers. Um, they're going to share their thoughts and answer your questions. Um, each will give a roughly 15 minutes talk. Uh, so later we're going to have a panel discussion. You can bring up your questions and then ask more as more as you want. Uh, so we're going to have beer networking after that. Enjoy more beers after. So um, let's have our special guest Eugene No uh, to introduce two interesting programs in the campus. Good to be back here with you at VPAP. I was here this summer, actually. Any of you were here during the June session where I talked about Icor and there were a few other groups skydiving? Okay, a handful of you. So this this will be it's kind of a fresh crowd, so this is good. Um, yeah, the summer was work was a slow time for VPAP, and, and I was kind of craving my uh, monthly visit to uh, to Stanley along with uh, the pizza. And so glad to join you guys again today for your uh, your fall kickoff. Um, the two programs I want to represent are the Innovation Core, um, the NSFI Core, as well as the Citrus Foundry. Um, I'd like to think about the i -Core program as the best first step for a researcher who's looking to commercialize uh, your technology or your, your research. Um, as a researcher, your focus is, is to figure out, does the science work? Kind of make the science work. Um, but that's a very different question uh, than what you have to ask when you're thinking about starting a business. Um, assuming that the science works, you have to, the, the, the business uh, questions you need to ask are, does anyone care about what I'm building? And those re it requires a very different mindset, a very different skill set, and a very different set of questions you need to ask. And so I is really designed to help uh, researchers make that transition um, from thinking about science uh, to the business. Uh, and so, as I said, best way to think about it, i is the best first step uh, in exploring commercialization through your research. Um, the second program that I want to um, plug is the Citrus Foundry. Um, it, is a, um, it is a startup accelerator that's run at, uh, at the Citrus at Siddhartha Lab Halls. Most of you have probably heard of it. Many of you have perhaps heard of a company that's gone through there at some, some time. Um, but I'm here to let you know that uh, we are opening up applications uh, over the next uh, four weeks. Uh, September 25th is the deadline for uh, the fall cohort. And so I'd be glad to talk with any of you who are interested. Um, this, is, this program is usually for companies that are either um, have already formed or are about to form. Um, the team is coalesced. Um, you have a sense of what your first product might be. Um, perhaps are beginning to think about your customers, um, but are fairly early stage. Um, but we are very interested in companies like you. Very early stage. Companies that um, have an interesting technology that might not be tested yet. Um, we'll be glad to talk with any of you. Um, you can go to the website, Citrus Foundry. Um, just type those two things in and you'll find the website along with application that's coming up um, in four weeks. And glad to talk with any of you or you're welcome to stop by for a visit and find out more about what we do um, anytime before the application deadline. So that's it. Uh, I think I'm heading it back to, yeah. Thanks Eugene for the uh, introduction. Anyone who is interested in the project, a program can shake hands with him uh, after. So we have a second guest to introduce our company from Sun Hi, all. Uh, this is Anura Ha Munshi. Uh, I'm from 
on this on craft energy. And I have two interesting pro projects actually for you uh, to participate in. Uh, one is on craft, which is for low income communities. It's basically solar integrated residential communities and also public transit, which uh, we are researching and looking for active participation uh, since. Uh, most of you know uh, there's a lot of need for that. And the other one is Color Earth Green, uh, which is a social media community platform for uh, educating uh, just not students but uh, communities to be more green, recycle, and um, improve our uh, whole planet. So these two interesting projects, uh, that's what I'm working on. And I'm looking for uh, interns and team members to come and join me uh, to work, to bring all the communities together, to protect our planet, not just from the climate change and other stuff, but we are uh, really going towards a lot of issues regarding um, soil contamination, water contamination, and these two projects uh, are really important right now uh, to bring us to the next level. So if you have more questions, I don't want to take much time, please do connect with me. Uh, I have my discards, some more information. Uh, feel free to call me up and uh, I'll leave the link uh, stuff where some of the community people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, feel free to talk with sir uh, afterwards. So we have uh, four future speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is Wes Salki. Um, so um, Wes has been um, a very um, uh, experienced in uh, uh, venture capital and uh, financial advising. Um, he is a man managing director and the founder of HyperVenture. Uh, so today, he will share the presentation of Pedro Pictures uh, to everyone. Welcome to Wes. 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 <laughs> All right, it's working. You can hear me? Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for having us here tonight. Uh, it's great to be back um, uh, on campus. Um, See, where is the, oops, sorry. So I'm a, I'm a fellow Cal grad, uh, graduated from the Haas School of Business in 2007, so go Bears. And um, I have been working in the venture capital industry uh, and business for the last uh, 10, uh, about 10 years. Uh, is that working? Good, no, no. Um, and so, you know, I, let's see, I started my career in finance and then came back to business school uh, to sort of transition from investment banking into venture capital. So that's really kind of uh, why I came back to school. But I also, along the way, got really interested in this idea of pursuing positive social and environmental impact through business. So really pursued a career in impact investing. So at Better Ventures, you know, we're, we have kind of a unique approach to back early stage software businesses that are building scalable and venture backable solutions to a variety of different social and environmental issues. Uh, from access to work opportunity to improving education, access to healthcare, and clean energy. So, uh, sort of big problems we face in society that we believe can be addressed uh, through sort of commercial uh, models. Um, let's see here. Um, um, so, yeah, so today yeah, it'd, be, it'd be good to get a, a sense for kind of who's in the room. So, I know you guys are. Primarily postdocs, I know some Haas guys uh, snuck into the event as well. Uh, they were mostly for the pizza. Uh, but uh, I get it. Um, what about, uh, so what, how many of you sort of are actively pursuing a uh, startup right now? Like, do you have a startup like in mind or you're starting? Okay, great. Uh, and how many of you have gone about raising some capital? Okay, all right, so it looks like probably about two, at least two thirds of the room sort of actively you know, are thinking about uh, fundraising and, and starting a company, and a few of you have raised capital. Um, so I, I've got some slides that I want to go through. 
Uh, you know, we do a workshop every Friday, uh, once a month, or the last Friday of the month. Uh, we've got one tomorrow. Uh, at, so we're based in uh, Uptown Oakland at the Impact Hub. And uh, we do these workshops uh, under this program called Better Ventures Pre-Seed. And we do a workshop on fundraising and pitching. And all of you are, are welcome to uh, register and come to one of those events. But the presentation that I'm going to talk about, or some of the slides I'm going to talk about today, are kind of from some of that fundraising and pitching uh, presentation that we get. And I'm hoping to, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds and granular. I know um, you guys are sort of a variety of different levels with thinking about your businesses and thinking about fundraising. But hopefully that can give you some of the sort of basic tools and understanding of the early stage landscape because uh, it really has changed quite a bit, uh, really in the past 10 years. And there's lots of reasons. I'm not going to go into that. But, um, you know, it used to be you had to go out and raise, you know, a million to $5 million just to start your software business. And that's really not the case anymore thanks to uh, things like, um, uh, you know, free software and uh, Amazon Web Services and, you know, you don't have to buy a server and those, those kinds of things. So it's gotten a lot cheaper to, um, you know, start these businesses and therefore there's been a lot of changes at the early stage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what that looks like and as you're thinking about embarking on fundraising, you know, the kinds of things that you'll need to have kind of figured out before you go out and fundraise. And if you figured out the science, like we just heard about, that doesn't necessarily mean you can just go out and raise, you know, a million bucks. Uh, you know, these days, investors want to see a little bit of traction. You know, the bigger the round you raise, uh, the more traction investors typically want to see, unless you're a multi-time uh, entrepreneur, sort of serial entrepreneur, uh, in, in which case you can sometimes just go out and raise a large round. Um, so this is kind of what the, the early stage landscape looks like today. This is the way we think about it. You know, Series A used to be the first round, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, these days, it's arguably the fourth round of capital that uh, that companies will raise. And uh, so what you'll, you'll see is, um, um, you know, companies go now raise that initial amount of capital. I call that your friends and family. FNF is friends and family. You're going to people that know you well, that are sort of betting on you personally, that, that know you as a person, uh, willing to put some money uh, into your business. And this is also the same, you know, kind of the same stage that you'd be at if you're applying for an accelerator program like Y Combinator or Techstars or the number of sort of hundreds of accelerator programs that exist out there. Uh, and this is probably when you're raising up to maybe about $100,000. And this is sort of, you've got, I'm going to talk in just a little bit about what kind of things you need to have to raise these kinds of capital or these kind of these levels of capital. Uh, you know, the next stage beyond that, you get into what they call pre-seed. And, you know, pre-seed is also kind of a newer category. It used to be sort of seed in Series A. Now there's been this emergence of the pre-seed round. Uh, who knew that there was something before seed, but there actually is something before seed. It's called pre-seed. And this is a round size, you know, up, arguably up to a million dollars, but, uh, you know, probably uh, on average closer to maybe like 500000 maybe 750000 uh, and then once you, you know, raise that round and then you get some more traction and then you go back out to market and then you raise your seed round. And this is usually where you're starting to talk about sort of the valuation of your business, these prior rounds you're normally doing with uh, convertible debt, which that's a whole other topic that we can talk about. Um, and then uh, once you've raised your seed round, you can go into sort of Series A land, which is you know, the bar has really risen uh, over time in terms of uh, what investors are, are looking for in Series A. And if, if none of this means anything to, to you guys, like don't worry about it. Uh, but this is sort of um, these next few slides. We'll, we'll talk about the kinds of things you need to have in place. You know, maybe once you've got that science sort of figured out, and then you're going to that, that next stage. Um, so at the friends and family round, you know, you want to have that initial. You want to have that team. And in technology, you're, you're typically looking for. The, the hacker and the hustler, you have the CEO and the CTO. You get the CEO that's really running the business and the customer facing, external facing side of the business. And then you've got your CTO, which is the product and the technical person that's really driving uh, the development uh, on that front. Uh, you know, we see companies oftentimes will come in and they won't have a CTO or they're outsourcing their technology. And you know, our advice that we give to these companies is you've got to have that initial team uh, together before you can really go out and start to raise uh, that next round of capital. Um, you know, getting to maybe that next stage of, of pre-seed, um, you know, if, you've, if you're familiar with Eric Reese's book on the lean startup, he talks a lot, he kind of coined this phrase of, of minimal viable product. And what a lot of companies will find is that there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg uh, when you go out to raise capital, 
you think you need to raise the capital to build the product, but then the, to raise the capital, you need a product to show the investor. So it, it kind of becomes this uh, conundrum where, well, how do I, how do I go about you know, doing that? And you know, the advice here is that you come up with your hypotheses around the problem that you're solving, and you really need to demonstrate that this is a big, painful problem that, that really needs to be solved. And the, and the bigger the pain that exists, the bigger the market opportunity is going to be. And number two, that the product that you're building, the solution that you're building, is something that can truly solve that problem. And it used to be that you would go out and spend millions of dollars and you know, hundreds of hours of development time you know, creating this, this product with all the bells and whistles, you know, the, the donut with the sprinkles on it, and you go and launch it, and it's a big flop. And, you, and you know, what you lack there was you know, going out and talking to the customers, uh, doing your true sort of customer development work to understand what customers really need. And that's what the Lean Startup that Eric Reese book is all about. If, you're thinking, if you haven't read it, if you're not familiar with it, I, I highly recommend it. It's a little bit on the sort of dogmatic side, but it's, it's a, a good read, and it gets you in that mindset of, of customer development, so you're not developing a product uh, sort of in isolation without, without the sort of the, the good context of, of customers. Um, so develop, you know, create that MVP. So, you know, at Better Ventures, you know, we, we typically come in at that pre-seed stage. You know, we really like the early stage. Um, we like that they've, you know, it's an opportunity for us to get involved you know, early on, uh, be influential in the business, uh, help, help uh, you know, make an impact in the company and, and the future of the company. Um, and we'll come in at that pre-seed. But you know, usually what we're looking for is that the companies have some semblance of, of an MVP and they're getting some good feedback from customers and starting to show some glimmers of what they call product market fit, so evidence of product market fit. And that, that's kind of a buzzword in startup land. But it basically means that you have a product that addresses a need in the marketplace, and therefore, uh, chances are you may be able to, to build a business. So if you're thinking about uh, you know, having evidence of product market fit. Um, you know, when you get to this next stage, uh, around you know, the seed stage, um, at this point, investors are looking for you know, traction. You, you really have some evidence of product market fit. You're generating some revenue. And uh, there's good um, evidence that uh, you're, you're building a business that, uh, that there really is uh, you know, addressing a problem and is commercially viable. Uh, but you know, you're, still, you're still early stage. You're still you know, pre-series A. Um, and this is a, this stage where you're kind of raising you know, $1 to $2 million uh, before you go out and raise a series A. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail on Series A, but you know this. This is you know, like I said, the, the bar has kind of risen on you know what you need to have in your business to raise a Series A. And this is the part where you know ten years ago this was this was you know almost sort of growth stage of the business, but today the bar has risen for you know, raising Series A capital, um, and uh, you're looking for uh, you know one to two million dollars of annual revenue. Uh, you're looking for a really attractive month over month growth rate, you know, high gross margins, low customer return, uh, et cetera. We don't need to go into great detail on this, but um, um, what, what I want to do is fast forward to this slide because I almost probably should have started on, on this slide because this is a good um, this, is, this is a good sort of framework as you know, particularly for those of you that maybe aren't as familiar with you know the steps that need to be taken to start to think about you know, commercialization of, of a, a product or you know, uh, something that you guys are building here at Berkeley. Um, and this is the way investors think. You know, these, are the, these are the buckets. I've, got, I've added impact up there for the impact investors out there like us. But uh, this is essentially what, this is how investors are thinking. And they're really, they're thinking about this at every stage of the game. I think what I just presented was sort of the nuances of the different stages of the early stage. Uh, but in general, this is what investors are looking for. So, um, you know, are you solving a big problem? You know, how big is this problem? Uh, you know, as soon as you go out and raise equity capital, you know, investors are typically looking for, you know, something along the lines of a 10x or more uh, return on investment if they're going to invest in your company. So they're looking for something that can be really big. So you go in and say, hey, this is a, a $10 million market, and that's going to be a lot less interesting uh, than you know, a billion dollar market or a $10 billion market. We're looking for something that's going to be a, a big market opportunity where they can you know, make a lot of money 
uh, if your company is successful. Um, and again, the more pain that exists for that problem, and the more sort of acute that pain is, uh, then the bigger opportunity is. So we worked with an education technology company that was formed by four former Teach for America teachers, and they were very familiar with the pain that exists in the classroom, and they ended up building a curriculum sharing platform that's sort of a drop box for schools. Uh, it's something called U-Class that ended up being, acqu uh, being acquired by Renaissance Learning. And uh, they were you know, very well aware of that pain as a teacher at you know, 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night. You've got to put together a mathematics lesson for the next morning. And you know that that math lesson has been created you know, 10,000 times over just probably the last couple of years by you know, hundreds of thousands of teachers uh, all around the country. And they created a curriculum sharing platform where teachers in the school district could share curriculum plans with one another across the, the school district. So you can essentially download uh, really solid, high quality curriculum sharing plans you know, right off of this platform. So that's an example of how you know, they, they were sort of acutely aware of some of the pain that exists in the classroom and, uh, and then built a product and, and ultimately a business around that. Um, you know, again, the solution, you know, launch an MVP, prove out your value hypothesis around how your solution solves for that pain. Uh, team is a really big one. You know, the, the hacker and the hustler uh, show that you've got both the business savvy as well as the product, the technical savvy of the team. Uh, you know, the market, I mentioned this uh, uh, around the problem uh, a, a minute ago, but you know, how big is this market? What are the market dynamics? You know, is it a really competitive market? Obviously, if it's really competitive, it's less attractive, unless you're building something that's truly disruptive, you know, on the order of 10x, you know, 10x cheaper, 10x better, whatever it is. Uh, but something that's, that's really disruptive. Um, you know, impact, again, if you're an impact investor, you know, we're looking at things, uh, we're looking at organizations and saying, you know, how, how is this addressing, you know, a fundamental human need? If you guys are successful, uh, like education technology is a great example. Like, you know, some technologies out there are arguably expanding the educational gap in society. If you're building a product that can only be sold in private schools because it's so expensive, like that's probably not going to cut it for us, but if you're addressing the educational uh, and opportunity gap in society and, and you know, uh, closing that gap, then that's something we're going to be really interested in. Uh, you know, business model, um, obviously, is really important. Uh, how are you going to make money? You, know, you need to be thinking about, and there it goes. Um, business model is, is important, and uh, you need to be able to communicate as soon as you start to raise capital, um, how are you going to make money? You know, how, if, if this, you know, how, how are you going to charge for this? Are you, is it going to be um, like a social network where you give it away for free and then monetize it with advertising? Is it an enterprise software, software as a service uh, type of program? It's a product that uh, you're going to charge, you know, a subscription basis, a, a subscription for whether it's on a monthly basis or an annual basis. So be thinking about it, how do you all to be monetized? And, uh, and make money off of this. Uh, and then you talked about traction, and, and um, the ask is more about you know, getting to the pitch, but uh, you, know, you need to be thinking about you know, how much money you're asking for, and thinking about where you are in that early stage. Are you, are you looking to raise just 100K? Are you looking to raise 500K? Are you looking to raise a million? Are you looking to raise you know, more than a million dollars? You need to be thinking about that. Um, let's see here. I think I've got, well, I think I'm almost out of time here, but. Uh, um, maybe maybe I'll, I'll leave on this slide. I mean, there's a lot to talk about uh, on fundraising, and, and Michael is going to come up, and the other speaker is going to come up and talk about more topics. But uh, you know, people always want to know, well, where do you find investors, especially like those early investors that don't necessarily advertise themselves? How do you find angel investors? How do you find you know five or, or ten people that uh, are going to invest you know twenty five thousand dollars each in your, your company? Those are really hard to find. There's, there's kind of a good, a good um, kind of rule of thumb here using well, things like AngelList or really uh, leveraging LinkedIn. So if you don't have a LinkedIn account yet, I, I imagine probably most of you do, uh, I highly recommend it. You know, build out your network, be promiscuous on LinkedIn, you know, say yes to just about everybody that asks you to, to join your, your network. Um, and build your network because as soon as you identify someone that you think might be interested in investing in your company, if you have a large network on LinkedIn, you will inevitably find a couple of people that have secondary connections to that person. And we just got done raising our $20 million second fund, and we have used this hack hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, where we'll identify the person that we want to meet with, uh, plug them into LinkedIn, and we'll find 10 to 15 connections that 
have shared connections with this individual, and then we'll write emails to that shared connection and say, hey, I see you're connected to Joe. You know, we want Joe to invest in our company or you know, our fund in our case. You know, can you make an intro? Then you want to be able to, you know, as soon as that person responds back and says, yeah, sure, I'll make the intro, we want to be ready to go with uh, a very short email that talks about your business opportunity and your investor deck, which we obviously didn't talk about today, but you want to have a, and that's essentially your marketing collateral is your investor deck, you know, 10 to 20 slides uh, deck that explains what it is you do, and be ready to go with that email. So this is a really good app for, uh, for finding investors. Um, so I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to see the floor to... focused 
focused on something in particular that you know your friend and your fellow founder is, introduce them. Pay it forward, pay it sideways. Um, when I find a founder who's working on an impact-oriented opportunity, who do you think the first person I call is? Call my friend Wes. Why? Because one, I know he's a great investor, and he's gonna support the founder that I'm speaking to. Two, that's his focus, so I'm not wasting that founder's time. And three, who knows what comes of it? Maybe that founder says, oh, you know what, I'm be partner's guy, he's a really nice guy, I'll introduce him to that other founder. So keep, keep, keep that in mind when you're going out here. Um, when you're on campus here, uh, the other thing to do is to be curious. And I mean, some folks I met outside have been here for two weeks, so welcome to Cal, go Bears. Um, be curious. Go to take that class that you never expected or never wanted to take, and um, it's just kind of a you know a hobby. Or um, sit down next to somebody who is looking lonely because their phone's out of juice and start a conversation. Um, you know, really take as as much advantage of Berkeley as you possibly can, because the moment that you don't um, uh, that you leave, you're going to wish you were here. Um, with respect to investors, you're going to need some pretty crazy things. So for those of you who are in the process of starting a company that will ultimately require capital from outsiders, um, you're going to meet people that are totally the wrong fit. They don't, they don't jive with you. They don't, they, don't, they don't see the world your way. Um, maybe they are too impact oriented. And you're like, you know what? I'm just going for the become a unicorn founder. I'm going to go public and I'm going to rule the world in a hundred billion dollar company. And that's okay. You could be an impact investor, by the way, and, or, or an entrepreneur and do that as well. But my point is, maybe that's all right. Maybe you need somebody who's kind of formal and serious and you know, older and whatever. And you're like, you know what? I'm the cool guy. I'm going to go drink beer and go to, go to, you know, go to Burning Man. That's great. You know, that, that's a fit for you. If that's a fit, go for it. Um, they're going to be your partner for a long, long, long time. Maybe longer than your current significant other, your wife, your spouse. Um, you know, we've been first investors in over half of our portfolio. My, my, my third investment was Two Mobile in 2007. They went public in 2014. That's seven years. 2016, still an investor in the company, so nine years. That's a long, long time to be partners with your investor. My point is to choose really wisely. Interview your investor, get to know them, understand why they want to make the investment in, in you and in your company. It's really important. So um, how do you go about doing that? Ask them what's important to them. Why are they making the investment? Do they care about what you're actually doing? Do they care about your customer? How do they see the world? How do they define success? Interview them. Don't do it. Don't don't only have them interview you. Okay. Um, I'm kind of done because we're gonna have a panel, and I figure we'll have some more time for Q and A. So um, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me here. We love talking to founders at the earliest stage uh, as as a first check writer. Um, it's predominantly enterprise uh, oriented companies and frontier tech for us. Uh, and, um, and so I'm looking forward to getting to know you guys after the event and there. So I'm going to see you later. Uh, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Wes, for sharing. Our um, next speaker is Arvind Dr. Um, he's a founder investor uh, in. Uh, uh,
startups and Fortune 50 companies to launch their new com, new tech products. So here I'll share the uh, presentation for, for the uh, uh, SOS Major today. Welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Right? You might have a scientific insight, but how does that 
insight change the lives of some person? Because if you're not going to change the life of some person, why? Why bother, right? You can go get a nice salary working in a big company, right? Or be a professor. Uh, so these are actual life decisions for you to make. And, and I think, you know, if you're going to go through the long, dark, hard road of being an entrepreneur, then that at the end of the tunnel is an important one uh, to drive you through that, uh, through the difficult times. So once you know you can change someone's life, how do we get to it? How do we get there? Right? A scientific insight is not a product. Right? So as I said, you have to go from an insight to a product. So how do you build a product from an insight? Well, you have to understand what the person that right, you're providing value to actually wants. Which means you probably have to talk to them, right? Not probably, you do have to talk to them. Right? So you go and talk to your customer. Um, this was alluded to earlier, right? With some of the, the startup methodology, which some of it applies, some of it doesn't. Um, but as a philosophy, it's, it's, uh, it's a one that you should follow. So you go and talk to uh, your customer, and you have to actually understand what is the pain that they're, that they're actually feeling. So another thing that I say all the time in Dubai is, or SOC, we do not fund solutions. I don't care about your solution necessarily. I care about the problem you're trying to solve, right? So if the problem is large enough and the most interesting enough, and you're a capable, driven, creative founder, I know you'll get to the solution, right? But if you're focused on a solution, you probably lost sight of the problem. And the problem is what drives returns. Really. So, um, as well as uh, changing the world. So, I think that, that's some of the some of the large things about just going ahead and starting a company, right? Um, another thing around. So, there's two sides. Once, once we're actually helping teams build their business, especially at an early stage, uh, when it might be a prototype or there's some there's some insight. How do you go ahead and build an actual business? Well. Like I said, there's an insight that needs to turn into a product. How do you know what's actually be? Talk to customers, how do you get there? Well, you could cold call. How many people have cold called someone? Fantastic, you guys are amazing, right? Like, you're ahead of the curve. That is critically important. How many people have guest email addresses? <laughs> so, so these are the things that you do to get to people, right? And get to customers, not just investors trying to give you money, right? And they're going to tell you what they actually want or need. You know, we had a company, um, it's fantastic. They, they could make stem cells, what, it was uh, 300 times cheaper than anyone else. And uh, uh, it was six times faster, all these, you know. It was literally amazing. They, they had revenues, they started, they had revenues halfway through the program. Uh, they, they took off, right? A classic hockey stick, no brainer. Money goes in, uh, and they fail. Why did they fail? Right? Uh, there are there are potholes everywhere, big sinkholes everywhere. Turns out that there was a the funnel for the sales funnel for stem cells is about a year long. So even though you're starting to get a little bit of traction again. Unless you get your funnel wide enough for a, for a sales stack that's this long, you're never going to have enough sales at the end of it to justify or to be able to support your own company or even get financing with the traction that you need. So they went they had a giant pivot to something else and are now very successful. But uh, the, whole, the whole point is there are so many unknowns trying to kill you, right? And a big part of getting from where you're at today to uh, the beginnings of a company that can possibly change the world uh, and therefore raise finance either through your own business or through venture capital um, is about taking these known unknowns, right, and, and eliminating them. I, I call them assumptions, right? Uh, and then the other one is to mitigate the box of unknown unknowns, right? Because those are the ones that truly kill you, right? Like, oh, sales stack is a year. How would you ever know that? Well, you know, they did talk to people, and no one ever brought it up. You know, you know, right? So how do you get to the things that, that, are, that are out there, but, but you just don't know to ask? And, and that's by going extremely fast. We, another thing we say is speed is safety. Um, 
And, uh, and, and that's really, really key. And, but science is slow. How do we do that, right? We have regulatory. Well, you can do all of those things really fast still. Um, and you just chunk it up. You, you make smaller chunks. And you stack break your assumptions. So you know, all of you guys, for your business, you can say, well, what's the biggest assumption I'm making uh, in, this, in this business succeeding, right? So you say, oh, OK, I want this business to be $100 million of revenue a year, right? So what's the assumption I'm making to get there? Well, people want it. There's usually one of the big ones. <laughs> so you have to go out and do this step. OK, well, how do I know people want it or not? And then you, you can generate a game plan. And we just call that in any bio, we call it create your own cycle, right? It's basically the scientific method. You have a hypothesis, test it, learn, the re up, right? It's the same thing, you just do it extremely fast and often incredible. Um, so, let's see, yeah, once you get all that, you know, you start thinking about financing. And so financing is, is, uh, is a very simple equation. It's you need money to grow your business. Well, the classic way of financing your company is you get revenue, and then you take some of that revenue and you use that to invest in your company. So uh, Ryan, our, our program manager, says this all the time. Um, he says, sales falls over there. It's absolutely true, right? You don't have any problems if you have sales. Right? Uh, someone will give you money? Fine. Who fucking cares, right? You have sales. Uh, someone wants to give you money, you could say, eh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think your valuation is a little low, right? So you got to go back to the, the, the fundamental premise of, Am I solving a problem for people? Am I creating value? And are they, am I creating a value for them to pay me for it? And if they are, I'm in charge of my own company, not a venture capitalist. Because banks are not going to make money, right? Uh, so that means sales, revenue, or venture capital for where, for where you're at. And, uh, and you have to sell a piece of your company, right? Uh, you don't want to have to do that if you don't have to. So don't think of venture capital as a thing to do. Think of venture capital as a way of financing the company. Uh, and it changes, might change your equation a little bit, how you think about what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, so there's a bunch of other things we could talk about. Uh, I think uh, there is such thing as, um, as raising too much money. Um, we can talk about that later. But that, that, that's the other sort of caveat that, that I can share. Uh, I've seen companies, what it does is it drives companies into a binary sort of equation. Where if you raise a bunch of money, no one wants to invest again if the current investors aren't going into the round, right? Because they're the ones with the most information. So let's say you raise a 10 billion bucks, right? It's your first check, you're like, yay, these guys, we, we did it, right? Uh, at a $30 million valuation, let's say. We gave up 30 million. And you're like, okay, we're, we're good, we're bold. Um, but then all of a sudden your science, your science doesn't work, you run a little slower, you burn a bunch of money, and you're like, shit, I need more money. And then you're like, okay, well, we'll raise whatever, $5 million and we'll get a $50 million valuation. Everyone's like, no way. And then the current investor's like, no way. And what happens to the company? Like, even though you might have learned exactly what you needed to know to, to turn the corner, right? Which is, I, I've actually seen it happen with those companies. Um, but but you just hit the end of the road. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways things can go uh, wrong. There's a lot of ways things can go right. Uh, find people that have a lot of experience, and uh, and that will do. So uh, luckily, uh, in Bio, we've uh, we've made 42. We've invested in 42 companies uh, in biotech. We're the world's largest investor in biotech, according to the Crunchbase, the U.S. size um, by volume. So. We've been lucky enough to be able to learn a lot, see a lot of patterns along those things. So, if you have some questions, we can talk later. Uh, over the week. Thanks, guys.
So if you're ready to ask questions, wrap on that. minutes talking about my experience in taking technology out of labs. And just to give you a real quick background, uh, it's been informed by uh, 10 years at the National Science Foundation working as an SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research uh, Program Manager, as well as five startups under my belt and now at N34. I sit on the board at N34 of two companies. One is called uh, Crescentia and the other is called uh, Neon Labs. Both of these are academic spin -offs. Crescentia is a company out of Colorado State University. They've developed a bio consortium for different types of naturally occurring bacteria that when you pour it into the soil, it helps plants absorb phosphorus out of the soil. That's important for certain types of crops. They're out of Colorado State University, and Colorado builds, or grows one particular type of illicit cash crop. And it turns out that uh, absorbing phosphorus in cannabis is like the primary way cannabis grows. And they have demonstrated that you can increase the value of a single cannabis plant by about 40% using their, uh, their technology. Neon Labs is out of uh, Carnegie Mellon. And they have a technology that looks at video um, uh, streams and identifies images within the video streams that might be important for different uh, audiences. So you can imagine a 14-year-old girl would uh, be more resonant with a particular image in a video screen, stream than a 35-year-old man. And Neon Labs is uh, funded to about the tune of $6 million. They're in the market now. And uh, both of these companies had technologies that were developed by postdocs in schools, and they were hard science projects. So what I'm going to be talking about is translating uh, university research into startups. Um, I think many of you have seen a curve that looks like this. Uh, this is a curve of the resources available versus the, the level of development. And uh, people have talked about the valley of death. Has anybody in the room not heard of the valley of death? So let me just give you a real quick reader's digest version. So public funds on the left, academic funds on the left, private funds on the right, and there's this gap between where the public funds end and the private funds are willing to step in. People have called that colloquially the, the Valley of Death. And small business and the federal government and so on have all these programs that are meant to help get companies across the Valley of Death so that they can pay taxes and generate what we, what we used to call an NSF, the cycle of life. So that's the theory. My experience is that it's a lot harder than that. And there are really four reasons why I found the, the, the experience to be so hard. I'm going to go through each one of these four very, very quickly. That's what I call the unknown, the confusion, the self-illusion, and the misunderstanding. A little bit about N34 Capital. My partners, Steve Blank, Jim Hornthal, uh, Tom Baruch, and uh, Ariel Morgenstern. The joke is, anybody, is anybody in here who's got an uh, aerospace background or an engineering, engineering background? Thank you. N34 is what? 34 times the speed of sound, right? That's the escape velocity for the Earth's gravitational pull. If you get going that fast, about 25,000 miles per hour, you can actually get outside of the Earth's gravitational uh, pull. The joke is that that's about the same speed you need to get outside of Mackin and Cloud. <laughs> it's really hard, really, really hard to translate the technology from an academic lab into a commercial setting. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, there's, there's no way to sugarcoat it. I think it's one of the hardest things to do in the business. So why is this so hard? I'm going to go through really quick. First, the end of So this is the theory, but that's total bunk. The reality is that it looks really more something like this. Academic research, small business, NSF, Department of Energy on the left, incubators and accelerators over there. But on the right hand side, it really looks like that. That's the principal challenge for taking technologies out of the academic labs. You don't know what that right-hand side looks like. If you knew what that right-hand side looked like, you'd be able to go to West, you'd be able to go to Michael, you'd be able to go to Armin and say, the price of this risk is, and you'd be able to have a rational discussion. The problem is you don't know what that right-hand side looks like. And that's what you're launching into. That's why you have to do customer discovery. That's why you have to figure out what the market opportunity is. That's why you have to figure out what your customers are. Because on day one, nobody knows what that looks like. 
And that's the challenge. So let's take a look at it one more time. So remember, it looks like this. Your job is to figure out if the writing style looks like that, or if it looks like this, or if it looks like that, or if it looks like this. If it looks like the one that I just described to you, there are no resources available, and the valley of death becomes the unbridgeable gulf of death. Stop what you're doing. There is no business. <laughs> Figure this out before you go out and raise money. Figure this out before you spend your friends and family money. I, I'm not kidding. It's, it's easy to raise friends and family money. People will write checks for you because they've been writing checks for you your entire life. <laughs> And when you don't do the work beforehand to figure out what that right hand side looks like, you're abusing that relationship. And you know, the, the old joke is that um, Thanksgiving dinners after you've blown fifty or sixty thousand of your uncle's money really suck. <laughs> and that's, that's that's even if the turkey is moist. So don't do that. Part two, why is this so hard? Entrepreneurship is the find of gathering the resources to pursue an opportunity. And I want to just take a minute to talk about um, technology adoption life cycles. Anybody know this curve? This is a really famous curve that was developed, made famous, I should say, by uh, Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm. He said you can divide up the way that people adopt technology based upon whether they're innovators, early adopters, early majority, and so on. And it's a really powerful concept. Most companies fail to identify innovators, early adopters. They fail to find that business model. And if you can't find those early innovators or early adopters, there's no way in hell you're going to be able to find the late majority or the laggards. And most companies that fail, fail because they start doing this before they nail that. It's as simple as that. They start to execute when they're really still in search mode. And if you do that, you run out of money, you run out of patience, you run out of patience of your investors, you burn out your team, you destroy value, and it's a really, really easy way to fail in a company. So part three, what I call the, the self-delusion. We've already heard that the sources of funding are a handful. You know, friends and family, you heard about, we heard about venture capital. You never heard so much about the government, but I will say that the government is the primary resource for probably 75% of the people in this room. The first funds that will go into your company in hard science companies, projects, come from the government. And then the program is called the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, the Small Business Technology Transfer Program. The federal government of the United States spends about two and a half billion dollars a year to see hard tech hard technology, hard science projects. It's probably the most, um, the first funds that will go into the majority of the hard tech projects that come out of an academic institution. Of course, we heard about company profits. That is by far the best way to finance your business. The problem is, is that you gotta build a business before you get to those, those areas. Commercial grants, nonprofits, etc. So the way that we used to think about this, and the way that I think about it is, there, there really is, four elements of risk to any business. You heard Arvin talk about his company taking on technology risk, and other investors will take on market risk. There are other elements. There are people risk and there are finance risks. And you have to know what your company looks like to your investors and to your partners, and ask, them, ask yourself, ask your friends, what is the risk profile that I present to my potential partner? If my risk profile is really, really small, that is, there's no market risk, there's no technology risk, we've done this kind of business three times, and we've also made our investors money, then you can raise money just about any way, any shape, any form. You can raise money by debt. That's the cheapest way to, to, to finance the business. If your profile is bigger, say, you might be able to raise venture capital. If you're inside of this risk profile, accessing venture capital is easy. If you're outside of this risk profile, accessing venture capital is impossible. And the key thing is for you to understand what your risk profile looks like and what the risk appetite of the investors at the table have. 
Marvin said that he takes technology risk. He probably doesn't like to take technology risk, finance risk, people risk, and market risk. So the, the point is, is that you have to know what your partner looks like. And it, if I may, um, Michael made the point earlier about knowing your investor. If you don't know your investor and you know your investor's risk profile, you're going to be having really conversations with people who have no shot in hell of funding you. Don't do that. Try to figure out what their risk profile is and figure out if you're a match. If you're not a match, don't waste the energy, don't waste the time. And then presumably there's different, there's different types, this is what we call Prince Family Tools. I think uh, Michael also conveyed that. And the idea is that through the application of programs, you mitigate the risk, you're bringing capital to the table, you mitigate that risk so that you can continue to live another day. And that's the idea of knowing what your, your enterprise is profile uh, is. Uh, wrapping this up really quickly, I want to talk to you about why this is harder than it should be. So this is the fourth part, what I call the, the, the misunderstanding. And does anybody know who, who Vanover Bush is? Anybody? So um, Vanover Bush was the head of science uh, during uh, World War II for the United States. And he basically was responsible for funding academic research that led to radar, the genesis of the Manhattan Project, the study of logistics, metallurgy, and like 10 other really earth-shattering innovations that were founded out of academic labs. And you know, one lab in particular, right up on the hill here, did a remarkable job of contributing a lot of, a lot of technology. And anyway, at the end of World War II, he, he went and made a case to President Truman and said, we have to develop this enormous capacity to develop, to, to take on technology risk, mitigate that risk, deploy it for the uh, uh, benefit of the armed forces. And, you know, we successfully deployed these centers of technology. We've got to figure out a way to build a system to support that type of research. And that really was the genesis of the Department of, uh, Department of Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, and all of the federal government agencies that support academic research. But he said to the, to the, to the um, president, uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to separate what he called basic research from applied research. And he literally said, we're going to build a program in academic research to support basic, and we're going to leave all of the industry to support applied research. Has anybody heard of the difference between basic and applied research and how academics don't do applied research? Yeah, some of you have. It's because Vannevar Bush made that case in 1950 that academics should not do applied research. So real quick, let me share with you, there's another way of looking at this. This is uh, an analysis developed by Donald Stokes. Donald Stokes was a, he was a think tank um, historian in Washington, D.C. And he said, this basic versus applied research makes it really, really hard to transfer any technology into industry. Why do we think about it along these lines? He said, we can think about it along another step, another way. He said, you can look at research and you can ask yourself, is the researcher interested in application? Yes or no. And is the researcher interested in a fundamental understanding of the technology? Yes or no. And he said, you can populate these areas with different personalities. He said, if you're interested in a really deep understanding of the fundamental technology, how many people in this room are interested in a deep fundamental understanding of technology? Most of us are, right? And that's why we're here. But you might not have a deep consideration for use. If you have that type of personality, that's good. You look like this guy. Does anybody know who he is? Neil Spohr, right? The father of quantum mechanics. If you have, on the other hand, a low desire for understanding, but you have a deep consideration for use, you might look like this guy. Anybody know who he is? Edison. Edison, right. Let me share with you two quotes from these two gentlemen. This is Niels Bohr. Everything we call is real is made up of things that can't be regarded as real. <laughs> now, can you imagine a CEO 
<laughs> motivating the troops <laughs> on the shipping dock of Amazon with that type of lead leadership charge. No, right, it's a joke, right? This is what Edison said. Anything I won't sell, I don't want to invent, is sale, is proof of utility, and utility is success. The guy didn't care, he couldn't have cared less about why the light bulb coated with carbon filament lasted a thousand hours. He just knew that if you got it to last a thousand hours, you'd make a ton of money. That's great. Has anybody ever heard an expression from their, their professor? The research you're doing in this area is Edisonian. Anybody? It's not a term of endearment. They're basically saying you're throwing stuff up against the wall to see if it sticks. Most researchers hate to be called Edisonian. I, I never really care all that much, but most, most researchers did. Then there's this other angle, this other quadrant. Consideration for use and a desire for deep understanding. And that's populated by a guy whose, whose name is, anybody? Pasteur. Pasteur, right. This is Pasteur's quadrant. In 1870, the French government realized that there were two pathways with which milk spoiled. One pathway led to this very valuable commodity, cheese. The other pathway led to this less valuable commodity, poison. And they realized that if they could figure out how to make cheese, they might be able to control the dairy industry worldwide, because cheese is a way to, to maintain um, the milk, preserve milk. And so they said, let's find a researcher, give them the money to go do this, with the desire to have a deep understanding and a knowledge for use. And this is, he did, they did this in, in 1871. My charge to you, as you are leading the academic effort, many of you in your labs, is to be in past year's water. You can do fundamental understanding that is also related to market opportunity. Past year did it, and he's the father of microbiology. You can do it too. It's my hope that when you're thinking about what your research is going to be in, that you're projecting to the end of how you're going to help humanity. Because if you don't help humanity, except for by publishing papers, I guarantee you, you won't move the needle. Because papers don't move the needle. Products and services and companies move the needle. And it's my hope that you will do that and focus on past year's water. So here are my four takeaways. Um, by definition, innovation contains the unknown. That's why it's so hard. Uh, engage the right hand side of the spectrum before you cut the material and execute. Uh, don't get confused, search with execution. And then uh, please, as you're starting your career or as you're even in the midst of your postdoc career, do use inspired research. It's okay. Pastor did it. He will still know his name. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to invite the panelists to the front. And we are going to have a moderated Q&A dialogue for about 20 minutes. Arvin, can you please join us? Yes, sir. So I think we have, can you hear me in the back? I'm going to, the back the I'm going to ask the panelists to mic themselves up. Michael, can you keep that mic in your hand? The rest, that's for you. Let's see if this one works. I'm going to just project. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. We have a great panel. You've heard the background of the people here from our perspective, and this is now your time. We have questions that we are going to bore you to death with, unless you have questions yourself. And I'm going to first begin while you're thinking of your first question. Please. Uh, well, I just wanted to 
to ask you a question about your graph and you push it off. Who would you consider to be in the low low? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the low low. Yeah. So the, the last quadrant, the quadrant that nobody wants to be in, there's a joke about that quadrant. And it's depending on who's in the audience. So it's not uncommon for me to make a joke and say, that's actually Michael's quadrant. <laughs> Please. Yes, go ahead, right there. Uh, so, what level of IP protection do you need to have before you can start talking to investors? At what point will they even be interested in hearing what you have to say, but also what level of protection should you have before you go straight to Great ready? question. Wes, can you take the first shot at that? Sure. Uh, my opinion is none. Uh, you know, it, it's obviously a little bit different if you're talking about some really hard science and uh, products that have a lot of science and development. You know, generally speaking, the kinds of companies that we back um, don't always have a really strong, you know, IP patent portfolio. If you look at some of the most successful companies out there, uh, it's not because they have great IP. Obviously, that's different if you're a biotech or a pharmaceutical company. But if you look, if you look at Uber. Uber, I'm sure, has some IPs, uh, some, some patents, and some IP. But uh, it's not, it's not a patent technology that's making them successful. It's a great idea. And, and really awesome execution. So, um, you know, uh, but, but if you are pursuing IP, you know, I don't think you have to wait to get IP protection before you start talking about it. I think uh, for, for us, like, IP is critical. Um, we, we won't invest in you unless you have IP. It's that simple. Uh, in biology, in life sciences, or chemistry, anything where there's massive technical risk and that's the actual barrier to entry, that's the economic moat you're providing with company in the future, and that's directly related to how you're going to be valued uh, by both the marketplace in terms of your competitors being able to enter the market, as well as your financiers in terms of, okay, uh, what multiple are you going to give this company? doesn't mean that you can't start talking to investors. I mean, you want to initiate the conversation against no people, but um, Absolutely. yeah, you want to have an understanding of how you're going to so, and so the, the, the question of level of conversation, like, I completely agree. Start talking to investors, like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. Great, nice to meet you. Um, if it, when it becomes a conversation of we're raising half a million dollars, we're raising you know, three million dollars, it's a very different conversation. Like, okay, well, what is the, at, we'll send you a pack. Right, so we can do due diligence on the actual patent filing. Uh, and what is your what's your field of use, right? Your, uh, your, your, how how is that protect? Have you actually looked at that? Like, these are some of the things that that we think are important in the long run of the business. But by every means, don't be afraid that your stuff is going to get stolen, right? Like that's the thing that I think that also allow people to pick up on. Sorry, no, no, no. Please. Um, just yell it out. We can hear you. Um, first question is for you. Did, have you. did you work with LC at yeah. um, Argonne? Red, Red, I think it's Redford. I, I don't know that name at all. Okay, she doesn't know that. I can't The question I have for the panel is, you know, with the VC funding down about 35%, and everything you talk about is pretty much your investors want 10 a what do companies do that are going to make a nice, you know, 50 million, 100 million dollar revenue with the profit? Um, where are they at the end of the road to get funding? I mean, what, 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 what do you recommend for other funding besides angel VCs? That seems to be the only thing anybody knows out in the bank. Like, you know, can you take yeah, a Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, without question, the best way of funding your company is through revenue and through customers. I think that was mentioned at some point. Yeah, there's multiple. Yeah. It is the best. It is absolutely the best way. So you can self fund or bootstrap your business. And if you can get there, then uh, you know, congratulations to you. Now, it, sometimes it takes time and you're not able to do it. Yeah, but most of the technology is proven out, FDA approval, industry has to have a test for five years. So where are you going to get the money to do that if the VCs aren't interested in it? Yeah, I mean, I would probably look at the investment banking community. There's a whole group of them that fund in the lower tier, right below, and more more interested than angels and VCs for 50, 100, 200, 300 million dollar companies. They're profitable. But it's, 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 it's all about risk and rewards. 
So you well, have just some more. Let's, let's move on. So yeah. next, next question, please. Yes. So I have a question. Like I've been um, hearing this a lot that if you are going to an investor, you need to have a big team. The investors are not comfortable if they just want two people. So and I, go ahead. I just wanted to take like know your opinion on that because I have seen so many cases where there's just one founder. Like I've seen one documentary on television. He was a technology. I can't remember his name right now. With Mark Zuckerberg, all the founders they left, and he was the only one who was remaining later on in the negotiations. And even in like any industry like restaurant, like there's only one chef who opens this restaurant, and they don't have an issue. But with technology companies, that there's one founder so who let's, always creates an let's, issue. Let's like turn the, let's turn the question on its head and say, why is it? that investors require more than one founder. Wes, can you take the first shot? Sure thing, absolutely. Um, it's really hard to start a company to be successful, so your risk goes up if it's just a single founder. Uh, the first issue is having complementary skill sets. Uh, again, going back to my analogy, like the hack of the hustler, you know, someone that knows business, it can deal with all the external facing stakeholders, customers, investors, et cetera. You have a technical product person that can handle like, building the product. And number two, you need that moral support. You need someone that's there, not only to divide and conquer and take on tasks that you can't do yourself, but they're there when, when, when shit hits the fan and things get really tough, you want to have someone there at, at night at 2 in the morning where you can you know, control the crime and that kind of thing. So when you want to get funding, you can hire people to make the life easier. Yeah, so, so that's that's the other one is once you, get, once you get funded, you can hire people and make the life easy. Like it. No, it, it, Investors are looking to back a founder or a co-founding team that can assemble resources, that have shown an ability to collect resources. How many billion dollar companies do we know that has one employee and has never raised capital? There are none. You have to be able to demonstrate your ability to, to have a gravitational force. And, and so we want that to be demonstrated prior to, we, prior, prior to making, a, making an investment. So you're proving to us that you can hire. You're proving us that you can attract resources. You're proving to us that you can build, uh, build networks. It's a really good point. I mean, like the first sale you ever have to make as a founder is to your co-founder. Why are they going to leave their life, their, their tried and true track to come join you? And so uh, there's another good quote that I'm going to really mangle. Uh, it's something like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, bring a team, something like that. And it's really true. And that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for go fast like for and then stop after 100 meters. It's, this is a multi-year, dark, long, hard road. It really is. I mean, it's, it's go, go talk to people. Go talk to people. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, um, not a deep, 
well, there's an expression in the investment world that whatever you do, don't try to boil the ocean. Okay. And it, or another way is, how, you know, how do you get help? And, you know, one, one bite at a time sort of thing. Right? So I, I think that the, the question is, is really how do you generate a movement? And, and I don't know if any of us have any deep I earn domain. a salary. I, I, don't, I, don't, I certainly have no experience in that area. Do either any of you guys have anything you want, any wisdom you want to add? One, one thing that we, one thing, you know, when you talk about creating movements, that I actually wasn't sure quite what your question was, I apologize, but um, I can just key into like creating movements. And so uh, you create movements by doing, uh, and by leading by example. Um, and so, I think, yeah, so, the, so when you look at like one of the things that we, invested in it and you very early uh, was the food selling agriculture movement, right? So this idea of, okay, uh, how do you take animals out of the food supply chain and actually shorten the path, the energy path from production to consumption, right? Uh, and so you, you do it and then yes, there's this other thing about saving animals that's important and, and helpful, not necessarily our intention in terms of doing the investments, but definitely an outcome of that. And, and so there, you, you have you have these other larger things that you can ladder onto. And so all of our, all the companies that we work with, because they're affecting so many people, and I assume you are too, uh, you can look for those for those things in, in society that you would ladder onto um, and and kind of be part of that. So in, as a business, you got to find a customer. Right, that's, that's job one. And your challenge in this situation is to find and define a customer or a set of customers in this grand vision. And that's really, really hard. That's, that's going to be the challenge. Any other? Please, right there. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think it really depends on the presentation that you talked about, the academia awaiting the value of that. You see increasingly a role played by the MBAs who are having a big background to help that back out there. And secondly, are you in your firm facilitating that process? Sorry, what was the last part of the question? Are you facilitating, facilitating that process in any way of, of getting the MBAs involved in the academia to spin up something? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take that. Um, absolutely. I mean, that's part about finding the co-founder or finding the complement. Uh, part of the way that we evaluate opportunities at be partners is to see how complementary the team is. And so, you know, sometimes we'll have three MBAs show up and be like, we're starting this company. We're like, okay, well, where's the technical founder? Well, we're at that. Or who's doing product and everybody raises their hand? Or who's doing marketing and everybody raises their hand? Or they're all at the meeting at the same time, which is a complete waste of time. So I, I would encourage you guys on the research side and on the MBA side, to just collide with each other as much as you possibly can. And if it doesn't fit, if that person doesn't fit for you, just say, you know, it's like a fit for you, but you do have a friend who might be interested in what I do as well. Um, don't give up, because it takes time to build that chemistry, and so just, just don't let go. Okay. How many costs, um, okay, great, thanks for coming. Wow, nice. <laughs> so there is a resource of Haas, her name is Rhonda Schrader. Rhonda Schrader runs a program called Startup Marketplace. Startup Marketplace is an attempt to do exactly what you just described. Find a researcher who needs somebody to be able to go and do the legwork of the customer discovery, the exploration. She is a wonderful resource, not just for anybody in Haas, but anybody who's uh, in the engineering or the, or the science schools as well, to try to, to, try to bring this uh, around. You guys know Ron is a star. Yeah. She's yeah. a rock star. Wonderful resource. Right there, please, and then we're going to go up there. Yeah, probably all the things today, but if you shy away from people who have non competing experience in a company that they potentially want to compete with, or from people who are trying to coach their co founders. Well, unless you probably have the most experience in terms of uh, a company that maybe it's not the same industry, but would have a strong legal team, let's say. Are we concerned? With people like non competes, so is it? Yeah. Um, I don't think we've come across any founders with non competes, but yeah, I think, like Michael was stating earlier, like this this idea of like the gravitational pull of a founder and their ability to 
you know, go and attract talent to them is, is really important, even if it's, you know, borderline unethical uh, to uh, go and approach people. I mean, we just, we, we want people that can scratch and claw their way to success. And actually, Michael and I have both invested in a company um, that will be renamed, uh, uh, unnamed, but it was a company out of, out of Haas, and uh, the founder is, is like that. I and mean, he's, he's, uh, he's poaching people left and right from other companies, other, other startups. Um, you know, I mean, not in an unethical way, but uh, Make him friends. Yeah, I mean, you know, we want aggressive people. That's it, right? Like, what are you going to do? You live by hanging out and just going, oh, I wish I, I wish I could have good people around. You know, like, that's not that's not how you build a company. Certainly not a, a groundbreaking company that, that changes the way people do it. And they will not find you. You have to find them. So I said customers will find you. Right. We've got time for two more questions. There was a microphone in the back, please. Yes. Uh, Two questions, actually. The first is: There a particular corporate structure that's most amenable to receiving venture capital? And so, what that is? What is it? And two, uh, two back to your reply of uh, the uh, four reply terms of risk. I was wondering if you could touch on the ones you had uh, towards the middle. Uh, interesting. Yeah. I do just uh, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. But first. Michael, you probably invest in the, the raw deals of the people among the yeah. team. Yeah. What, I mean, what structure do you like to see? It's always, if you ever are going to raise institutional capital, capital from, from outsiders, non friends and family and fools, you want to structure yourself as a Delaware C Corp. Uh, you know, afterwards, uh, Wes can talk about the B Corp status because he's an expert in that, but you definitely want to be a C, a Del a C Corp. And the, the reason for that is it's structural, it's tax related. Um, it's about you know, potentially going IPO at some point. There's a lot of nuances to it, but it's it's C corp. So don't waste your time being an LLC and then convert into a C corp, but you can just become a C corp if you think that you're on the venture model. If you're not, if you are going to bootstrap, if you're never going to raise capital again, then from a personal perspective, as an individual proprietor or owner, there are two other uh, structures. There's the LLC structure and there's an S corp structure, and you should talk to a professional and an expert as to which one's the better course of action for you and for your type of company. But if you ever raise outside capital, do do a C corp. Do you want to add anything to that, Wes? Oh yeah, spot on. So um, let's. Your, your question is so um, detailed and specific. Let's take that off the line for sure. Here. Well, one final question, and that's going to come from Eric. How, how much more time do we have? Tell me how much more time. Talk to us through the diligence process really quickly, and then we're going to go over to you. Uh, typical MBA answer, it depends. Um, there are some investors in the world, some of which write relatively large checks, and I'm talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars, who will take a single meeting and say yes or no on the spot, and sometimes will wire you a check within 24 hours. Those folks are rare, and when you find them, can you let me know, because they're really easy to build tickets with. Um, most of us uh, that are institutional uh, will go through a diligence process. It's typically three meetings, um, maybe some customer calls. There's probably some scientific uh, diligence that you do. In terms of how to get there, just ask. Hey, hey, investor, am I doing the right thing? Are we on the path towards an investment from you? Where are we in the stack of interest? Oh, uh, along the lines of that question about contracts, or guarantees, or issuing shares, or is there some kind of formalities that go along with that process? Yeah, I mean, typically uh, we want to see, any investor will want to see uh, the, uh, the, 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 the entity created, so the Delaware C Corp created. We want to see invention and assignment agreements um, already established, and founder agreements established as well prior to us investing uh, in the company, prior to providing you with, 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 uh, with a dollar. So preliminary capital. We're going to have to move on. This is getting to master class. You can ask me later. Please. Just chat. Oh, OK. Uh, so if you uh, have a B2B product, uh, you have an MVP that works, uh, would you suggest this way for the first client? And having somebody who basically finds it uh, through? Or what are the I think it's almost time. <laughs> Wes, can you take that 
got the, the first tab that I'm going to ask sure, you. Sure, so you, you do a B2B business and you're trying to figure out like, how do you ship the initial product? I think you may, maybe said something about getting yeah, the first customer to finance it. Or? It would be better to put it and so I just get the first line <coughs> Right. Uh, yeah. To, to the extent you can ship an initial, you know, MVP, you know, very bare bones product, uh, you're, you're better off um, because it's if you don't have the product, you don't have something in the hands of customers, then it's just a lot harder to raise capital from even an angel investor. You might be able to raise a little bit of friends and family around uh, capital, um, you know, from people that don't trust you. But you know, generally speaking, you want to be able to. Uh, you know, put a little bit of money to work and create some sort of product and get it out of the hands. And if you can find a way to get customers to finance your product, uh, that that is that's kind of the holy grail. It's tough, it's tough to do, but if you can find a way to do that, then you can. Because the farther along you get before you raise that first round of capital, uh, you're going to give away less of your equity. And you hear about somebody very successful, like I think GoGro, and the one where these founders you know bootstrapped into to tens or hundreds of millions of revenue, and then they go IPO and the founders still own. You know, seventy percent of the company because they got to such a great place before they raised that first round of capital. Okay, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us uh, the last parting words. But uh, before I do that, Arvin, is there anything you want to add to that last uh, response? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I think the, the balance that we've all said it's better to take to, to bootstrap, right? Um, and I think maybe you were saying like if the customer wants to invest, that's a different question than it is. There's all sorts of reasons why that might not be a good idea, uh, like actual investment equity versus just paying to buy. So, uh, but it's always the balance of bootstrapping your company is the speed at which you can go. Unless you are making literally millions and you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars in excess capital in, in profits that you're plowing back in your company, it's going to be very hard to go fast. Now, when does speed matter? Always. Uh, but when does it matter most? When you're in a foot race with other other companies to be first market. Again, returns in an industry, in any industry, as you guys all know, because we uh, engage in here, uh, favor of the industry leader, right? And it's a huge power law of returns within an industry. And so VCs all know this. So we're all looking for the industry winner. Like, why will it be number one versus number two, right? Um, and so oftentimes, even though you're having mass attraction, you, you go and raise money to make sure you can keep that lead against all your competitors. And that, that's, a, that's an important part of understanding it. Now, the traction will help you raise on good terms so you're not selling 50% of your company, which you should never do, but uh, that's not a uh, You're not selling a huge percentage of your company for a very small amount of money. So by the time you do, through blood, sweat, and tears, get to the exit, you will actually see the return that you once thought you might uh, leave with us. All right, we are now at the end, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give us their 45 second last thoughts. What, what would you like to leave this audience with that maybe you wish you'd known when you were in the seat not so long ago? Wes? I think my parting words would be will it into existence because that's the way things get created. Uh, there is no if, there's only when, there is no try, there's only do, uh, Yoda. Um, but it, you know, it, and it really, it comes out in everything you do. It comes out in how you interact with potential employees. It comes out with how you interact with investors. You need to say things like, if we get here, if we get there, you look a lot less sure of yourself than if you say, when we get there, when we do this, when we do that. So you just have to have that kind of mentality that this is going to happen. By hook or crook, we're going to get there. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, um, there's mostly MBAs in the room, so I'm kind of speaking more of the MBAs than the, than the science crew uh, in the crowd. But look, you're going to come up with some OK idea, and then you come up with a slight, slightly better idea, and you're like, OK, good, we got something, let's go for it. Uh, just be patient. Find the amazing, the incredible, the truly inspirational idea that you get so passionate about that you talk about nothing else. And it, it, it like rewires your brain that you are crazy, literally crazy. And, and go after the big and the huge because it, 
the, the competition for capital, for human resources is so incredibly high that you, you, you might as well go big. And, and I would just encourage you to really just be patient as you find it and go find it and wait and wait and wait. Armin, bring us home. Yeah. So, let's see. I think the, the thing that I'm continually thinking about this all the time, but the biggest thing you can do is invest. The first thing you invest in is yourself, right? So you have to make that decision. Am I going to go work for someone else super hard, long hours to get a piece of whatever stability or security that is? Or am I going to work super long, super hard hours to make what I believe can happen in the world come true, right? That's a fundamental question you have to ask yourself and make yourself before you can take the first step, is are you gonna invest in yourself first? Um, you know, that, that's actually a big thing that I had to overcome but before I did my first startup, right? And then after I did a startup to go into venture capital side. So I think that was, the, you know, when I was in literally where you were at, the perfectly cushy job set for life. Right, and left that because I wanted to invest in myself. So I think uh, you, know, you guys are all way more qualified uh, to do that than I was back then, that's for sure. So I think, you, know, um, you should do it and, and go, you're, you're here for a reason. You know, go home, think about it, and make it set. All right, I guess that's the charge to go kick ass. <laughs> Please join me. <laughs> Thank you.